Hello everybody, I'm Aaron Standard, and today we're gonna to be making a real short video on a topic that comes up often in our work on Akka.net and TurboMQTT and some of the other projects we work on here at Petabridge, head of line blocking, which is a common type of flow control problem that affects lots of different applications. We're gonna go ahead and discuss it mostly in the context of TCP today. Now, head of line blocking can occur in any queue or stream based system. So, RabbitMQ can potentially have head of line blocking. So, can an in memory queue that, that you're doing producer consumer work off of. Head of line blocking is actually a fairly common type of flow control problem. But TCP is the classic area where it shows up most prevalently. HTTP 1 and HTTP 2, for instance, are built on top of TCP. HTTP 3 is moving to the quick protocol specifically to avoid this problem because it actually becomes a bit of a scalability challenge once web pages get complicated enough where there's lots and lots of assets that need to be downloaded. So we'll talk about that at the very end of the, of the video today. But for the time being, let's go and take a look at what TCP communication might look like. So imagine you have kind of like a client server interaction. This could be a web browser talking to a web server potentially. The application is going to generate requests. These are just normal objects. These objects in order to be transmitted to the web server or to the TCP server, if you're not using uh, HTTP, they have to be serialized. So that means we have to take you know, an HTTP request and turn it into a binary representation. So it's a byte array essentially. That byte array then has to get encoded into the data stream that represents you know, all of the traffic in the TCP socket. Uh, what that typically looks like is we have to perform like frame length encoding where we describe you know, this byte basically indicates how big the next message is. We pull all those messages off of the TCP buffer and then we deserialize them and then route them to the server application who will process them and then run this exact same process in reverse. So it'll go ahead and transmit data back to the client, which then has to be decoded, deserialized, and then routed to the application. The interesting part we want to talk about today is that TCP stream kind of sitting in the middle between the client and the server. The TCP stream is duplex, meaning there's one of these for each direction, client to server, server to client. When we're looking at just one of those streams, what you're going to notice here is that we are going to have basically a layout of bytes. A TCP stream is basically a contiguous sort of, let's say, data stream that's going through. And the reason why it is that way is because we have reliable delivery. Therefore, all of the packets need to be received in the same order in which they were transmitted. A unreliable uh, messaging protocol like UDP does not have this requirement. Every datagram is effectively independent and they can be received out of order and delivery is not necessarily guaranteed for them. But for TCP, they're all laid out in this ordered stream like this, which is what makes it uh, reliable. So in this stream, we're going to take a look at the first packet if we're going left or right. Uh, the first packet right here is going to be a header that describes how long the next message is. So this is a one byte header that describes a four byte long message. So we're gonna discard the header. We're gonna take these four bytes and we're gonna route them to the serializer for deserialization. And the deserialized payload will then be routed to the application for processing. And then next we have another message and then another message. And then we might have some empty bytes if there isn't any more data waiting in the channel. So let's assume that we only have 16 bytes of total data. TCP won't allow a, a buffer this small. It has to be, I think, uh, paged in kilobytes. But for argument's sake, just to keep things simple, let's go ahead and say 16 bytes is the most we have to work with. So what does head of line blocking look like in this system? Head of line blocking happens when you have a really large message or a message that takes a really long time to process that is essentially consuming the entire channel. Therefore, all of the other message traffic that we might want to try to send between these two applications is going to essentially be blocked by this big message that is sitting at the head of the line. And you end up with the pig and the snake problem where in order for any of your message traffic to get through, you have to wait for the snake to finish digesting the pig first, which is going to take you know, weeks and weeks potentially in, in this analogy here. So the idea is that head of line blocking is essentially a source of potential inefficiency and flow control problems in any of these sort of streaming applications because a really big object 
that is going through your data pipeline or going through your queue can basically cause all of the other messages that are waiting to be processed to have to wait for an extraordinarily long period of time. That might mean you end up getting requests that time out, or you might have some heartbeats fail, and there's all sorts of problems that can potentially stem from this. So this is a really common flow control issue that presents in a ton of TCP systems, but really any other, let's say, queue-based system where there's only a single consumer is also vulnerable to this type of problem as well. So this leads me into talking a little bit about the solutions to headline blocking. The first example of this is multiplexing. So if you're using RabbitMQ, the way to get around, let's say, a, a consumer that is you know, processing a really large message that takes a really long time to process, the answer to that is to have many consumers. That's a type of multiplexing right there. So one consumer might be blocked on a big message, but the other consumers can continue pulling messages from the queue that maybe are smaller or less complicated or just take less time to process. But other examples of multiplexing are things like interleaving multiple messages across the same channel. That channel, I wrote here that it could be physical. It also could be a logical channel. Uh, this is where the Quick protocol comes in, for instance. Quick is a new standard for being able to do reliable messaging, very similar to how TCP works, but it's built on top of UDP. So essentially, instead of delegating the reliable delivery down to a lower layer of networking, the protocol itself basically accounts for this using things like sequence numbers and delivery sequences and so forth. But the real innovation behind Quick that is resulting in it becoming the de facto standard uh, transport layer for HTTP 3 is that it has the idea of logical channels built into it where you can have one Quick connection that can have a configurable number of channels running across it. This means that in the context of, let's say, a web browser, if we're using HTTP 3, I can have one HTTP request to a server, download all of the different assets in parallel that are on that page. So every image, every JavaScript or CSS file, and the HTML itself can all be processed in parallel over the same request. So rather than having to open lots of different TCB connections to access all those different resources, we can do it across a single channel. This will help improve uh, bandwidth utilization and reduce latency. The other way to do it is how web, web browsers work today. They multiplex by opening multiple connections. This is going to introduce more strain on the server. It's going to use more buffer bandwidth on both the client and the server, but it'll get the job done. It'll make it so if there's one really large asset that has to be downloaded, like a video file, that's not going to delay the rest of the web page from being processed. So that's how it's done today, but multiplexing is kind of a more efficient approach to solving that problem. And that's what the future of HTTP is going to look like over the next couple of years here. So this is our little video on head of line blocking. I hope you liked it. Uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel to get more updates about distributed programming.net and aka.net and more. Thank you very much for your time.